Yes, great. So I'm uh, Dr. Mary McComas, and I'm the new superintendent here in Kent County, and I'm excited about the opportunity to come join the community. Well, you know, in the last month, I've been able to begin meeting with people, and it's really important to me um, to really seek to understand first uh, before we collaborate and build a plan forward. So what I'm really finding is people are ready to refresh their vision for Kent County Public Schools. And I think people are also looking at understanding the blueprint, how to operationalize the state's vision around the blueprint for us here in Kent County. So what does the blueprint mean for us here? And how do we make uh, the vision of that work for our community and our specific needs? I think that's what I'm hearing from everyone as I meet with people. Of course, there's natural uh, curiosity and uh, challenge that goes with the blueprint. You know, people are very aware that the blueprint is a lofty vision for uh, our school systems here in the state of Maryland. Um, I would agree with the philosophy of the blueprint. Who doesn't want the, you know, a globally performing school system, right? We all want the very best for our children because we know that and understand that they need that for leading the world, right? So the challenge is how do we take the best of that vision and make it meaningful and relevant for us in our context here in Kent County? Um, and so to me, my vision for our community engagement this year is really to get out and meet with as many people as possible. For me to hear what they want for their children and want for the community in the long run, to understand what their satisfied with, what they're perhaps not yet satisfied, um, and then to really engage the community over the year in developing our next strategic plan. I'm fortunate in that the timing of this opportunity, the school system is wrapping up its final year of our current strategic plan. And so it's a perfect opportunity or inflection moment, right, for us as a community to sort of have that reflective conversation about where we are today. We know the the most recent couple years have been fraught with a lot of challenge as a, as a world. Um, and we finally have kind of cleared those challenges related to the global pandemic. And so now is a natural point to come together to say, what next? Where do we go from here? And while I certainly have my ideas, um, I think what's most important is that I listen to the community and that I understand the community's desire for preparing our young people. Um, and so I bring to the work that sort of uh, expertise as an educator on the how we get there, but the where we want to go is something that we have to do together. And so to that extent, I've been meeting a great deal with, um, you know, I've met with our board members. I'm excited. I'm um, scheduled to meet with our county commissioners in the next two days uh, and our county administrator. Um, I've also uh, been working with my team to schedule other community roundtable meetings with nonprofits and the, the town um, elected officials as well as their uh, state delegation opportunity meeting with, uh, and I'm not sure if I said this, but business uh, leaders as well. I met with Mr. Goodall last week. I was appreciative of his time that he took. Um, and today I met with um, Miss Gray and we went over and visit the Horizons program, which is sort of part of their philanthropic work for our community. It's wonderful to see the program there. And um, I'm looking forward to meeting with our nonprofit partners. Um, and the key here is that right now in these summer months, it's, these are really preliminary meeting opportunities. Uh, but what matters most to me is that over the next 12 months, we robustly engage people. And so I'm asking you, I'm asking everyone who hears this, bring a friend, come out to our meetings, uh, bring somebody with you. Because what matters to me is not just hearing from our parents who are critical in this work, but hearing from our neighbors who don't have children in the school system. Because their opinions, their thoughts, and their engagement matter. It matters. None of us can um, afford to opt out when it comes to raising the next generation. Yeah, I think to me, you know, having the perspective, and I'm fortunate because I've worked in um, Harford County Schools, Baltimore City Public Schools, and Baltimore County Public Schools. So I've had a nice uh, level of experience working at uh, small, medium, and, and large school systems now. And I think fundamentally, our greatest challenge uh, with the blueprint is our um, greatest asset, which is our people. 
we know in school systems all across the state, and I suspect across the nation, um, paying our employees, the, our teachers, um, is our largest part of our budget. And of course, the blueprint um, with its vision really seeks to elevate the profession of teaching. Um, and one of the strategies for doing that is elevating its pay. So when we look at pay is approximately 80% of a school system's budget, and I'm just speaking generically here now, but Kent County falls into that same general framework. You know, so when we talk about paying teachers at an, a higher level of professional pay, uh, that coincides with the level of education that we require for their expertise, uh, that's a challenge. And I think that's a particular challenge for smaller school systems, um, whereby, you know, the tax base is is different compared to more urban um, settings. And so that's our biggest challenge. So, uh, my journey into education, um, really, I, th I think I, in some ways I was the accidental educator. So um, I, um, trying to think, how do I describe this? So I really fell in love with history first. Um, I was fortunate as a, as a child, my father had been in World War II, and we always had National Geographic magazines, right, and the Smithsonian magazines, and my father always talked to me about, you have to know what's happening in the world around you, because as an 18-year-old, he was deployed to D-Day, right? So he very much instilled in me this idea that you have to read, and you have to understand what's happening around you. Um, and so... Um, I fell in love with history, and uh, my parents didn't go, they didn't graduate from high school. They only had an eighth grade education, and, um, and so it was instilled upon me, one, that I needed an education, and that love of history, it became a matter of like, well, what do you do with a history degree? Um, and so teaching became um, sort of a path for me. Um, and I think I'm a typical educator in that I, f I came into teaching for what I was passionate about, but what happened in the classroom is I fell in love with young people. I fell in love with how open-minded young people are, how eager they are to have mentors in their life that are in addition to their families. It's, I found it was critical for a young person to have an adult in their life to be a sounding board for them to talk to, to help um, them discern their path in life. And so I fell in love with working with young people and my career took me kind of backwards. So I began as a high school teacher and, uh, and loved it. I taught uh, 10th grade world history and some social studies elective psychology and a research course. Um, and as I grew into administration, what happened, somebody said to me is, you know you're ready to go into administration when you feel like you can do more than, than your classroom allows you to do. And so I, I moved into um, administration, and then I had the opportunity to work with middle grade, middle school students, which most people um, you know, struggle because it's a tough time for kids and their families. Um, and I have since come to absolutely love middle school children. Um, and then I ultimately, as a principal in Baltimore City Schools, it was a, an elementary and middle school. So I had that opportunity to really learn about elementary instruction and, and how profound it is to teach a child to read. Um, and then what do we do when they struggle? to read, most importantly, right? Um, and so I've been very fortunate in that my journey continues to broaden my perspective um, and has just made me uh, that much more committed um, to being that guardian and advocate for children of all ages. Um, you know, what I have learned over 28 years of working with young people is that when a person, and frankly, even for adults, when a person is acting out in some way, they're doing that out of a, f a fear. And we fear the things we can't control. And so when a person is acting out, um, that's that fundamental instinct to fight or flee. Which, so we have to go back to what's the um, cause of that? What is causing that child, that um, person to feel that they need to fight or flee a circumstance? And that we have to really unpack what that root is. So that could be Something like we often see in children, um, they're being asked to do something that they 
are afraid they can't do, right? Academically, it may be reading. Let's say we take a child that um, neurologically is dyslexic. They don't know that. They're a child, right? And their moms and dads may not know that, right? And their teachers may be actively in the process of figuring that out, right? Children don't show up with a little description that says, hi, I'm neurologically diverse. I will struggle to learn to read in the traditional fashion, but I'm outstanding in math and, and artistic skills, right? Children don't show up with that, so it takes time to unpack that. And they often don't have the life experience and maturity to articulate that on, for themselves, right? And so often when children are acting out, we have to take time as the adults to reflect on what is that telling us? What, what is it they're afraid of? What is it they're seeking to run away from um, and, or fight about, right? Because it's human instinct to protect ourselves um, and to not feel vulnerable. Um, and so that's once you learn to analyze student behavior in that um, lens, it becomes um, less personal right, um, and more clinical about how do we support this young person in moving forward. And I would say it's the same, you know, social emotionally, right, um, when we see students hit adolescence and puberty, their emotions are different every day because biochemical systems are changing rapidly, neurological systems are changing rapidly. And again, they're not worldly enough to articulate and say, you know, my my chemistry is off today. <laughs> I'm not having a good day, right? Uh, so they often struggle to advocate for themselves. So we have to be consciously paying attention to where they are and then responding in, in a fashion that's supportive. I think the other thing that's really important about student behavior is when a child does have a bad moment, right? They are acting out or fighting or fleeing. How do we address their needs and then restore them to the community? Because that's a piece that for many, many decades has been left out of the equation, right? We don't have people come back into a community and sort of um, restore that sort of wholeness of function in the community, right? Because it's important that we help people shed shame, right? When people act out, they carry the guilt and shame with them, even though they may not express that. But how do we make sure that they're welcome back into the classroom, welcome back into that relationship with their peers and the teacher in a way that is healthy and productive for everyone to move forward? Easy to say, not always easy to do. Um, but in my, in my professional practice, what I found was transformative for my school in Baltimore City was um, consistently applying restorative practices. Uh, and it transformed my school. It, it reduced violence by 93% as measured in referrals. Um, and we really uh, create a place of peace and prosperity for our students. And I think I, I would not have believed it had I not lived it. But having lived it, I completely believe it now. Right. Because we're whole people. I think that's, you know, school systems were designed during the Industrial Revolution for the most part. And they have functioned in that a highly efficient factory model. But we are not items. Like, we are whole humans. And I think, you know, the, the challenges of the last couple of years have really brought forward to the community, I think all of us, our awareness of we can no longer deny that every student is a a full human. Our teachers are full, full, full humans, right? And when we, we have a problem, we need that restored. We need to come back to a place of integrity so that we can move forward. And when we don't do that is when we have persistent problems with students, persistent difficulties in relationships. And I, um, I appreciate that. I think the, what is striking me as I'm coming to um, learn more about Kent County as a community, is there is a, a, a desire to really refresh who we are, what we want for our school system. And I'm excited about that opportunity. I think uh, we have really good foundations in place. The choices we've made over the last couple of years relate to Orton Gillingham and reading instruction, um, our uh, math um, curriculum that we have. Illustrative math is really a, a problem-based approach, which is much more um, sophisticated mathematical reasoning we're asking students to do. 
really um, wise choices that have been made with the Maryland Leeds grant. Um, and so I'm just, I think it's just important for the community to, to feel excited about our schools. Um, and I'm looking forward to engaging people and really sort of breathing energy into the, the solid foundation that we really have been working on. I, as I meet with people, it's interesting because naturally people share their perspective with me. Um, and often when I start digging a little bit more, like, well, why do you think that? Or what's your evidence to that? Um, what I'm seeing is we have a lot of work to do to help open up the schools and help people see firsthand uh, for themselves a around what is happening in our schools, as opposed to perhaps hearing from their neighbor um, or hearing just sort of in the general air, right? Come and see for yourself um, and, and help us along the way. So.